Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's so good to have you joining with us for worship online. We continue our studies in the book of Joshua. We will look today at some verses that are not easy for us to understand. We will need the wisdom of God and the leading of his spirit. So as we begin the service, let us pray. Lord, we want to offer our worship to you now. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. And we ask that as we turn to your word, that he would illumine its pages and help us to understand what you are saying to us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing together that lovely hymn, What a Beautiful Name.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you in a time of prayer and that you continue to provide for us and show us your love. Thank you for our church family here in First Arts. We pray for our young people, whether at school, college or university, and we ask you to keep them safe wherever they may be. We pray for the sick, vulnerable, the lonely and those who are struggling financially, those who may have lost their jobs and in some cases their homes. We ask for your comfort to those who have been recently bereaved and that you give them strength at this difficult time. Our world and society is divided more now than ever. It is sad to see people at war with each other, to see them pull apart rather than pull together in unity. We pray that those in power are shown your wisdom, guidance and direction needed to make the right choices and decisions. We pray for your healing, safety and protection amidst this current pandemic but that we should not be scared or fail as we can, do only what we can. In the end, we must trust that it is in your hands. We thank you for the Reverend Jim Campbell for his faithful preaching and teaching of your word over the years and for his love and devotion in all his ministry here in First Arts. We pray that he and Adrian and family will have a long and happy retirement and be blessed in all they do in future. We pray for the future of our church family, for your wisdom and guidance in the appointment of our new minister. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with us as a church family during this time. We ask for all these things in your holy name. Amen. Reading this morning is from Joshua chapter 6, verses 21 to 27. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. But the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day, because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Hello boys and girls, mums and dads, and everybody in church today. You might think I'm wearing something very strange today. I'm wearing the um, presidential chain of the Irish CE Union. And this is quite an interesting uh, chain of office. 
Recently, I have taken on being the Irish Sea Union president, and I'm going to be one of quite a number of people on this. As I look through the names of the people that have served in CE over the last number of years, there are familiar names of people over the last few years, quite recent, and I know those people and have met those people. There are other people through here that go back over the years and I have no idea who they are. I have never met them before. But this chain of office goes back to 1898. And this tells a whole story of the people who have served and how CE has moved in the island of Ireland over the last number of years. Many people will know that our own CE in Newton Ards and in, in, in First Ards was formed by Harry Martin and Harry Martin was a past president of CE and his name is up here somewhere on this uh, chain of office and he served as Irish president in 1956. You can ask me to see it sometime over the next couple of years. One of the other things I absolutely loved doing was researching family trees. I was a bit curious as to where did I come from and what was my family history like? Was I related to people who were still around here today? People that I maybe didn't know I was related to? So I began to ask a lot of questions to family members to try and find out a wee bit more about who was who in our family. I got a lot of the names of people and I started to delve in and research and using the internet was able to find out so much more information. We go back and we look over um, the, uh, the census information from 1901 and 1911. And I discovered that our family lived not too far from here. They lived in the Portaferry Road in Newton Ards and they lived down in, in Cunningburn. So I did a trip down there, had a wee look around the place and discovered the types of houses they would have lived in and the small stone built cottages that they would have had. I then discovered a relative who was still alive and still lived and still had connections with um, how it was in the early 1900s and had a good chat with her and discovered what life was like growing up for her on the shores of Strangford Lock. The people would have, uh, the family members lived together in a small house. It was a, a two bedroom house and there could have been 10 of them living there. It had a, a lovely garden and they grew lots of things there in the garden uh, to be a bit more self-sustaining. They went to the local school the local school then was Mount Stewart Primary School. Further on down, uh, closer to Mount Stewart, you'll see the old schoolhouse. And that was about two miles and they walked there. Later on, whenever that closed, a lot of them would have gone to Lockery's Primary School, which really wasn't that far away. Uh, but still, they walked to the local school. And so they used to go and fish in the sea there in Strangford Lock. And they used to provide fish and so on to uh, Mount Stewart back then. I delved a bit further back to try and find out, well, how did we end up on the shores of Strangford Lock? And discovered that we came from Scotland and our family tree goes back to the 1600s. One of the interesting things for Gronya and myself was to discover, discover the name James in the family. And James, uh, we had no idea whenever we uh, named James, our son, that you know, it was a big family name over all the generations. Um, so it's amazing when we research and find out more about our family tree. There's a family tree that's mentioned in the Bible. And if we look at Matthew chapter one, we can read the whole family tree of Jesus. And it goes back generation after generation. And it's amazing to see where uh, Jesus came from. And what we can see in there is that it goes back to Rahab, who we have heard about. You'll remember in the Bible reading today, we heard about how the city was destroyed. But we hear about Rahab and about her family and how they were allowed to live. Rahab was told to get all her family together in her house and that the God would save them. Their lives were saved because she hid the spies and she was obedient uh, to what she was asked to do. Rahab and her family were saved. 
She knew that God was in control of the situation. She did as she was told. Promises were kept and the family saved. So Rahab is in Jesus' line of the family tree. It's amazing to discover the big picture that God has for us and that all through history, God is faithful to those who follow him. The Bible that we have today is really God's um, story of how all through history, God is faithful to our family. Let us be, be thankful today to the family that we have and to those who have made us what we are today. And let's remember Rahab and the part that she played and her faithfulness to God. Amen. to know our God again. The Lord is good, the Lord is strong and we will live our lives for him. Today we are faced with a verse from the Bible that we probably wish wasn't there. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 21. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep and donkeys. The Israelites destroyed every living thing in Jericho. What makes their actions doubly hard to understand is that they were carrying out the commands of God. At the moment, civil war rages in Syria. Thousands of civilians have been killed in the conflict. Assad, the president of Syria, has ordered the bombing of homes and hospitals. He has used chemical weapons against his own people. 
We have seen the pictures on our TV screens of the dead bodies of women and children, as well as the horrific injuries many more have had to endure. There has been justifiable outrage across the world at the callousness and cruelty of this man's actions. Yet here we find God ordering the destruction of a whole group of people, not just the defenders of the city, but defenseless elderly people, women and children. The opponents of Christianity have seized on this verse and others like it to cast a slur on the character of God. Thomas Jefferson, one of the early presidents of the US, said the Old Testament account reveals God to be cruel, vindictive, capricious and unjust. Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion goes even further in his criticism. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, forgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, maglomaniacal, pseudo-masochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. We don't know how to respond to such criticisms. And if we're honest, we too are embarrassed by this and similar passages in the Bible. They present a side to God's character that makes us uncomfortable. In addressing this matter, we must begin with the question of God's character. And we need to recognise by ourselves, we can never determine what he is like. The gap between us is too great for humanity to come to a proper conclusion on this matter. The only way we can know the character of God is if he should reveal himself to us. And this he has done in his works of creation, his actions in history, and supremely in his son, Jesus Christ. We have the record of this revelation in the pages of the Bible. All too often, when people speak of God, it is obvious that it is a God of their own making. It's how they like to think of him rather than how he shows himself to us. One of the ways this happens is when people exalt one of his attributes above all his other attributes. The Bible clearly affirms God is love. We latch on to this part of his character and forget about all the other aspects of his character. He is holy. This speaks of his otherness and his moral purity. He is opposed to rebellion and evil in all its forms. He is majestic, righteous, faithful, wise and just. All these attributes exist in God in perfect harmony. Hence, God's love and justice are not in opposition to one another. All his judgments are an expression of his love, just as his love never violates his judgments. People are often very uncomfortable with the thought of God's judgment. They don't like the belief that they are accountable to him for how they live their lives. One critic of Christianity put it this way. God calls upon us to forgive others. Why can't he just forgive us without judging us? The answer is twofold. The first has to do with the character of God. If God does not judge wrongdoing, he ceases to be righteous. He would not be true to himself. The second has to do with the status of God. He is the judge of all the earth. If God does not judge human disobedience, 
It would mean that there would be no difference between right and wrong, good and evil. It would involve God turning a blind eye to all forms of evil, injustice and cruelty. He would respond to such issues with indifference. Surely, if this was the case, he would not be a God worthy of our worship and devotion. Also, the God of the Bible is one. Some attempt to deal with these difficult passages by drawing a distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. As if the God of the Old Testament was cruel and vengeful, while the God of the New Testament is loving. In their minds, God has evolved or improved over time. But there is no warrant for this in the Bible. In fact, you find repeated emphasis on God's love and mercy and compassion in the Old Testament. While in the New Testament, no one speaks more plainly about judgment than Jesus. Realizing our understanding of God must be grounded in the teaching of the Bible. We turn to our verse from, Jer from Joshua. Why did God command the annihilation of the people of Jericho? The Bible gives two reasons. The first is this, the corruption of the Canaanites. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 4. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you're going to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations. What happened to them was God's judgment on their wickedness. The evil of the Canaanites is well documented. They practice brutality, cruelty, incense, bestiality and cultic prostitution. At the heart of their worship, they performed child sacrifice. They had become thoroughly depraved and God had to remove the cancer. Their destruction was his righteous judgment upon them. He had the right to take their lives because he had given them life in the first place. As one person notes, people assume what's wrong for us is wrong for God. However, it's wrong for me to take your life because I didn't make or cause it. For example, it's wrong for me to go into your garden and pull up your bushes, cut them down, pull them up, transplant them or kill them. I can do it in my garden because I own the bushes. Well, God is sovereign over all life and he has every right to take it if he wishes. In fact, we tend to forget that God takes the life of every human being. It is called death. The only question is when and how, which we have to leave up to him. And this brings us to the second reason for their annihilation, to avoid contamination. God gives this reason for the destruction of the Canaanites in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16. Do not leave anything that breathes, completely destroy them. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshipping their false gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. I want you to notice false worship, idolatry, leads to corrupt behaviour. The Canaanites had to be removed because of the negative impact they would have had on the Israelites. They would have led them astray. Israel would have followed their detestable practices and hence faced the judgment of God. 
God's desire to protect his people wasn't simply for their sake, but for the benefit of future generations. It was through Israel the Messiah would come who would be the saviour of the world. As Christians, we are the people of God. Our calling is to live holy lives, not simply for our own sakes, but that we might witness to the living Christ. Corruption and contamination were the reasons for God's judgment against the Canaanites. What doesn't come out in our reading is God's patience with these people. Back in the book of Genesis, God told Abraham in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. God could have judged the Amorites, the forefathers of the Canaanites in Abraham's time, but he waited 400 years, giving them every opportunity to turn from their evil ways. Katie has a cocker spaniel named Kimmy. She's only six months old and she has a bit of a defiant streak in her. When she is in that defiant mood, my patience with her doesn't last four minutes. But here was a people group who were becoming more and more corrupt. Yet God delayed his judgment for 400 years. And even as Israel marched round the walls of Jericho, there was still time to repent. One of their number, Rahab, was saved because she turned to the Lord. But the Canaanites had so hardened their hearts against God, judgment could no longer be delayed. Now, you might be thinking, I can see the reason for the destruction of the people. But what about the children? Why did they have to be killed? Some have suggested that evil was so endemic in the nation, it had corrupted the children. This may have been true of the older children, but what about the babies and toddlers? Some believe when the Canaanites knew that they were going to do battle against the Israelites, the women and children would have left the city. I have no answer to give to the killing of the children except to say in the words of Abraham, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Who are we to stand in judgment on God when his judgments are so much superior to ours? His judgments are perfect because he knows all things which we don't. And he can see into the future, which we can't. These verses are meant to serve as a warning to us. God has not changed. Like the Canaanites, we too deserve the judgment of God. We have rebelled against him and broken his laws. And God simply can't turn a blind eye to our wrongdoing. He can't simply forgive us. His justice must be satisfied. So God took our flesh and blood. Jesus lived that life of perfect obedience to God that we fail to live. He went to the cross in our place. God taking upon himself his perfect judgment for our rebellion. And at the cross we find God's justice and love meeting. God paid the penalty for sin in full, that through Jesus, we might receive the forgiveness and welcome of God. This is a time of opportunity for us. God's judgment has not yet fallen, but we mustn't think 
that because God is patient towards us, delaying his judgment, that his judgment can be avoided. Jesus alone can deliver us from the judgment of God because he bore our judgment for us. If we continue to refuse him, we never know when our hearts will become so hardened against him. We will be incapable of turning to him. As the apostle reminds us, now is the appointed time. Now is the day of salvation. Embrace Jesus and like Rahab, rejoice in his deliverance. Let's turn together to pray. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your cross. Your cross where your justice and love meet. We thank you that when you judge people, you do what is right. You are entitled to do it. You don't rush to do it. You are so patient with us, giving us every opportunity to turn to you. Help us never to presume upon your patience. But help us to realise our unworthiness before you. To look at what Jesus was willing to suffer for us. And help us to open our hearts and our lives to him, perhaps for the first time. Or to renew our commitment to him. For we ask these things in his name. Amen. And we conclude our service with a hymn that helps us to think about the character of God. Jesus is Lord, the voice that echoes through creation. Oh
could I encourage you to say the grace along with me? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.